Hi, I'm Chosen Architect, and this is All The Mods 9, and today I'm setting myself a fission reactor to produce polonium and plutonium. Oh, and utilize all of that fizzle fuel from last episode. So, I hope you guys are ready. Today we are jumping back into some more All The Mods 9, and today I have it planned to set up a fission reactor, but it's gonna take a little bit of setup before we actually get the fission reactor up and running. Now, if you missed it, last episode, we set up fizzle fuel and a lot of fizzle fuel. So this is already maxed out and is no longer running at the moment. So we need to get our reactor up to start using this so we can really see where we stand as far as how many millibuckets per tick we actually produce in fizzle fuel. Um, so we'll be able to use this as a gauge and be able to read the loss rate that uh, is, is coming out of this. We'll be able to see how much is being transferred, which is pretty cool. Uh, but this is completely modular. So if you missed it, be sure to check out the last episode um, because uh, this is very helpful. This is what determines how fast you will actually make antimatter from the fission reactor. So the more fizzle fuel you make, the more that you can feed to your reactor and the more waste you generate, thus the more polonium and all kinds of other stuff you can make quicker and also the faster you can get your SPS running and start producing antimatter. Now, before we can get a fission reactor up, there's still some things that we need to do, mostly precautionary because we don't want to run our fission reactor without having a ton of things prepped up beforehand. Now, one of those things is being able to actually make all of the components like a solar neutron activator. And to be able to make this, we need HDPE sheets. And this may seem kind of difficult, but we technically already have most of this puzzle solved. This is the same process where we produced substrate. And if you remember, we are kind of voiding substrate once it gets to a certain point, just to produce ethylene but we're not producing liquid ethylene. We're actually burning the gas version of the ethylene in a gas burning generator. And at this point, we no longer need the gas portion of this. So what we have here is essentially the bottom half of the HDPE sheet automation. The only thing we need to do is we need a rotary condensator that needs to receive the ethylene and turn it into liquid ethylene by simply placing that. Then we need a PRC on top that is going to receive the fluid um, and receive the ethylene. And then that needs to receive the substrate. And then we can just take the substrate and feed it into, as needed, into our um, enrichment chamber, which is right over here. Now, along with liquid ethylene, this also needs oxygen. So thankfully we produce a ton of oxygen. So we should be able to just simply send oxygen from our gases menu and output it to the right and auto eject. That is then going to provide oxygen. Now all we need to do is pull the substrate out of this barrel and we need to put it into this machine. And I can do that with refined storage. Now to make this sort of like its own subnet and use it as a piping system, all we have to do is use an external storage. I'm gonna set it to extract only so we don't accidentally insert into it later on and then figure out exactly where this machine is at, which is right here and just add an exporter onto it. So all I have to do is set the substrate to go into the back of this machine, and then we need to make sure that under the items, the back is set as an input. And perfect, the machine is working. That is producing HTTP sh uh, sheets, and then over here, or not sheets, the pellets, and then right here, it's going into this barrel. And then I just need to lock the barrel and uh, then set a external storage onto this drawer. So even though we weren't getting a lot of gas from our gas burning generator, it still was nice that we set it up because it saved me in the end. So pat on the back to prior chosen. So now to just build the HDPE sheet recipe that goes inside of the enrichment factory. And uh, perfect, we have sheets. So let's go ahead and craft a sheet. And just like that, we now have HDPE sheets, which means we can make the solar neutron activators and start crafting those. Now, at this point, we should be able to start producing our fission reactor and actually building the thing. So this is my idea. I have an idea kind of having it sunken into the ground, keeping it level and flush with the top of this building, which I think will be pretty cool. Um, now I have it into the kind of water here and I, I cleared out the water place blocks and got it all removed. Um, but if you want to know the dimensions of this, this is technically a nine by 11 by nine building uh, structure. Uh, but you can build this thing all the way up to an 18 by 18 by 18, which is the max size that you can build the fission reactor. 
not necessary in our case, and I can always build another one in the future if I need more waste. But for right now, this will just get me started. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at how we need to build this. So this is reactor glass, and the reactor glass is going to line the edges, not the top and not the bottom, but the outer area. Um, we're also going to need these logic adapters. These logic adapters are what we're going to use to control this with redstone to make sure it never goes boom, because these reactors can blow up and irradiate an entire area. It's kind of awful. But well, you want to be very careful when building this thing. Next, I'm going to need these fission fuel assemblies. This is actually what's going to hold the fizzle fuel. And you want to set them up in a pattern like this, sort of a checkerboard pattern, uh, just like so. And in the floor here, I counted, and I'm going to need 25 per level. And so I needed 200 of these fuel assemblies to fit into this very specific reactor. Um, and yes, you can use the wand to build up. So we'll go ahead and get these all the way up until we're right above the max line. And that's where we use these control rod assemblies. They need to go directly on top, just like so. Another quick way you can do this is by putting it in your offhand and then right clicking. And then the whole thing is pretty much built. And then we just need to enclose this with our casing. And that's basically it. Um, so if I put this yet again in my offhand and I make sure to set this to left and right, we can just build this out like so. And our reactor, once we get the glass in, is technically a completed structure. And you will know it is a finished structure whenever you place the last block in and you get these fancy little redstone particles. Now, interestingly enough, we do need exactly four ports, but we may need more ports later because I plan on voiding off steam uh, from this reactor that it will generate from us pumping in water. Now, we also need to send it fuel. So I'm gonna send the fuel into the face right here. Um, because I kind of want to keep the face of this clean. We're going to be working a lot from the sides, um, both sides actually. So we'll manage, for example, steam over here. So let's go ahead and just put this over here and we'll say this is where we're managing our steam. This is where we're going to input water over into this side. And then let's just say the back here is where we're going to manage our waste. Um, yes, that's right. This is where we're going to be producing the waste that is going to get processed and... This is where things get a little bit more tedious because if we were to start putting fuel in here, then we immediately have the risk of one, blowing this thing up. We also have the risk of potentially like, uh, I think blowing it up is the worst thing, but irradiating the area just by placing a pipe and breaking it. Before you turn anything on, you want to make sure that everything is in place and everything's going to work because you don't want to accidentally put a radioactive material, AKA the waste that this reactor makes, and you don't want to put it in a pipe and that you need to break. Because if you break the pipe or the machine, well, your whole base is gone. So you know what? To actually prevent this from exploding, before we get into how we're going to put water in it and many other things, let's go ahead and let's get ourselves some redstone logic set up for this so that way it doesn't blow up. So for this, we're going to need the, the fission reactor logic adapters. And I'm going to place one here, 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 and here. Um, and then we also need one down here or kind of anywhere else. You can put it in the middle, I guess, right here. You know what? Let's try and put it right here in the middle just for nice symmetry. Um, so what these do is this, once we have the whole reactor assembled, go ahead and let's see, I'm missing a spot here. There we go. Once we have the reactor, uh, reactor assembled, we can access these. So notice this is going to emit redstone signals based on certain things that can happen. So we can set it to redstone mode, high temperature. So whenever it receives a redstone or whenever it reaches high temperatures, it can emit a redstone signal. And then we can go, if it uh, has excess waste, emit a redstone signal. If this one right here, if a damage is critical, emit a redstone signal. Over here, if there's insufficient fuel, emit a redstone signal. And then right here, we can say, okay, well, turn this on if it has a redstone signal. Now this may seem kind of counterintuitive, right? but it will turn off whenever it doesn't receive a redstone signal. So by default right now, it is off. But if it was to receive a redstone signal, it would be on. And that seems kind of interesting, right? Uh, because what we need to do is these are going to emit a redstone signal. Well, that means this needs to have a constant redstone signal um, that can, we can toggle on and off. And then it needs to have that constant redstone signal so that way whenever these do send a signal, it can invert that signal 
and will actually shut the reactor off, which is a way that we can hopefully fail safe. Now for this, I wanna use some redstone links from Create, so we can use some brass that we have from our farm, by the way, uh, and we can just go ahead and make some of these brass casings, and this will allow us to create the redstone links. And redstone links are so good. Um, so let's go ahead and make these. These are wireless redstone that we can program multiple different links all to one thing. So I can have a link here, here, and here, and I can set them to a certain channel, and then I can have this send a redstone signal to this spot right here. But as of right now, I don't really have a good way of getting that redstone inverted, but there is a mod in here. Now, so my goal right now is to take the redstone link and I wanna make another one. So I have these programmed to the glass. So let's go ahead and get that redstone signal sent over. And as you can see, this is sending a redstone signal. So we do have something to work with. And all we have to do is take ourselves a redstone link, for example, this one right here. And let's go ahead and program this. And then this will receive a signal. Well, once we use a wrench, um, specifically the one from Create. Uh, looks like I'm missing a lot of these ingredients. There we go. So yes, the wrench is actually needed for this. Let's go ahead and get that, perfect. And we just need to right click the wrench on here. And now that puts this one in receiving mode. Um, so now that this is receiving a redstone signal, let's talk about the tiny redstone. I'm gonna place this mod down here. And this is a panel that we can use these tiny little redstone components to build circuits. And what I need to do is in the middle here, I'm gonna place down this piece of wool. This is just a regular block that we can use, for example, torches. And I'm gonna create an AND gate that is going to run here, it's gonna receive the signal, right? And you can see it's powered. And then I'm gonna put a torch on this side and that's gonna to toggle it off. And so we can go ahead and continue feeding our redstone line to the edge. And that means I can have another one over here. And I'm gonna set this to the fission. And so if this is gone, notice it flips the signal. So that is perfect, right? That's exactly what we want to see. We want to see this signal inverting. Um, so as soon as I put this one in receive mode, we will now see that that has inverted the redstone signal that it is receiving from here, meaning that I should be able to put a link onto this. And we want to do this before we have anything going on in here. And then I'm going to go ahead and quickly program it just like this. And that should be good. We just need to put this in receive mode and perfect. This redstone signal setup should be running and, and working just fine because this is not receiving. But as soon as this does trigger, that will then send a redstone signal, turning the reactor on. As soon as we have enough fuel, as soon as we have sufficient um, uh, damage control, as soon as we have efficient uh, waste and all of the numbers match up and as soon as our temperature is correct, everything will be running and the reactor will stay on. If not, it will shut off. That is the way to prevent your reactor from exploding. Now I know that's quite a bit, but let's talk about how we're going to simplify this reactor and make it very easy. And that is going to be with how fast we should be able to transfer water into this reactor. Now to be able to do this, this is where integrated dynamics is going to come and start to play a pivotal role in this particular setup. So to be able to do this, we are gonna need a squeezer and I'm actually gonna show you a way that you can automate this very quickly with just two armor stands. Um, so this is a very, very easy thing that you can do. And all you're gonna need is a clock of some sort. So like a clock or a timer. Um, I think RF tools has a timer that works just fine. So we can go ahead and use a timer. Go ahead and make sure we have all the components for it. Um, but this is, this is gonna be fantastic. So. Once we have this set up, it's pretty cool. Um, so we're also need a drying basin um, that is going to help out a lot as well. This is gonna be needed to make the blocks, but all we have to do is place this down, place the squeezer so the line is pointing into it, place ourselves two armor stands on top. Now this can be, uh, it's a little easier said than done, but we are gonna need like some cobble, some blocks, and if I go ahead and place my first armor stand down, and then I go up here and above it, place another armor stand, I can actually drop these armor stands on top. And then let me hop on here and squeeze this all the way down. 
And now with it as low as it goes, I can go ahead and put my timer on here. And that is going to send these things up and down, thus semi-automating this whole process right here. And then I can just push this in and notice I don't have to manually jump. It's just doing the work for me. That's pretty cool. Now we don't need a whole lot of this. We just need a little bit of the mineral that we are getting from this process. And you can hopper into this and hopper out of this if you wanted to. What a goofy little setup this is, but I absolutely love it. All this does is it helps jumpstart the production of the upgraded machines from Integrated Dynamics because there is a mechanical squeezer and mechanical drying basin, but you're gonna need quite a few of these minerals, which means you would have to manually jump on this, well, unless you do this. So honestly, after getting very little of this, you don't need a whole lot, but as soon as you get just enough, you can go ahead and upgrade this entire setup and make it absolutely automated uh, by simply making the drying basin, the mechanical version, and the mechanical squeezer. And these placed together um, will work just like this. And you can have this auto eject into the drying basin. And so we just need to get some nodes. So from Pala, let's put just a couple of them on here. And then we can put now the wood in here and that's going to automatically generate the mineral chunks and also the crystallized mineral for us. Okay, okay, I, I know you want me to cut to the chase. L let me show you how fast this can transfer water. Now down here, I have myself a sink, so infinite water, right? And then in here, I have myself a fluid interface and a fluid exporter and some logic cables and a single variable card. This is all you need to send the water into this thing incredibly quick. Now we are going to want to make sure that we have this port set appropriately. So on our configurator, you can actually change this to output, cool it, input, and we wanna make sure it's just set to input in which it currently is. Now, the fluid interface is going to connect to this and it's going to create, basically look at this sink as if it's an inventory and look at what it's actually holding. So it's looking at it as a tank. And so if I put that on there, that is essentially what that's going to do. Now the fluid exporter is going to, on any of the channels it's connected to, it's going to look for the inventories and it's going to pull from these inventories. And so I can place that right here. So that's going to pull into our reactor. Now we just need to add our logic cable and there we go. But it's not done yet because we need to set the export card by simply placing it into export all fluids. And that's going to start putting water in. It doesn't seem that fast. Well, yet. That is because we need to go into the actual properties and go into the transfer rate. And well, let's just set this to 999999999 right before it stops its integer limit. And then we go back one. And then once we have this set, this should now be the transfer limit. And well, that is enough water to power this thing and keep it sustained forever. Um so Normally, you will run into problems where you won't have enough water to liquid cool this. Not in this case. This thing right here kind of removes the entire need for having turbines. So this is very, very nice. The thing that Integrated Dynamics can do is send fluids incredibly fast into things that will allow it to, such as this reactor. Now, steam is still going to be another problem because we are going to need multiple outputs to handle the amount of steam coming out because there's no way for us to pull the steam out aside from using mechanism cables. Now, in order to get coolant out, what I'm using right here is the same ports, but I have more than one of them for the same thing. And I just need to set them to pull extract from the coolant. Um, and, and this should pull steam into the ultimate trash cans, which I do know void it. So uh, that's gonna be what we're gonna do. We're essentially just making a waste producer. I don't need the steam. I know I could use it to generate some more power, but it's such minuscule power for the amount of things I have to set up. It can also cause some other major problems. Like uh, if I mess up in any way, the steam will build up in the machine and well, trigger this to shut off, hopefully, but there could be other consequences like it actually not working and blowing up. Now, a big way that we can reduce the amount of radioactive material is by utilizing radioactive waste barrels, which will decay things over time. And so what I can do is set up this entire room for this. And this is a kind of cool that we have this all set up. But what I want to do is I want to pipe over here and we are going to use and, and need to set up some gas cables uh, from mechanisms, AKA tubes. Um, and I'm going to be using uh, these pressurized tubes, the ones that are the maximum. 
and let's go ahead and make like 190 of them uh, because I need every single one of these barrel slots to have access to this uh, because these decay slowly over time. And so the more I can maximize, the more waste I can feed to this um, and the, the faster it will decay over time, eventually leading to there being no waste at all. Now, if you've done Applied Energistics, there is a complicated way that you can actually use the, the Mega Cards uh, for radioactive waste material, but that's a whole convoluted setup in itself. So this is why I need these uh, waste barrels set up. It is for this setup right here. So essentially, we are going to be producing polonium pellets and we need to produce uh, plutonium pellets. So plutonium and polonium, these two, use one uses an isotopic centrifuge, one uses a solar neutron activator, as you see right here, but they both function the same way and they process the same way. We have a crusher that receives fluorite, that fluorite then gets sent into a PRC that's receiving water. And uh, then whatever this process is, so it's going to process the waste that comes out of the reactor for right now before we send it on. Um, and then this is going to convert it into uh, plutonium. That plutonium in the PRC is going to get converted, but it also produces a byproduct in this process. It produces spent nuclear waste. This is what we need to send over to those barrels to get rid of. Uh, but what we want is the product is the plutonium. So the plutonium is going to end up going inside or going into a barrel that's going to be up top here. Now I do have the waste configured to go below. So what I'm going to do is mine a couple of blocks down and we need to figure out where exactly we're gonna send this. Um, I'm gonna go back behind the copper paneling here and this is probably gonna pop through the wall on the other side. I just need to go ahead and mark where I'm going to do this. So that way I will have a nice transition to get to this point. So yeah, it's definitely going to make its way back here. So perfect. Um, now the only thing we're gonna need to set up is make sure that the gases under the gas section is set to auto eject and it is, and we don't even need to configure that in any way. We should be able to just let it do the thing that it's doing right now and just hope that that works. Um, and yeah, this is where we, we need to cross our fingers. No, it, it should work. It should honestly work. Uh, but I do need to line all of these cables on top of every single one of these. Yeah, th this might be a little overkill. It might seem a little too radical, but uh, I, 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 you can never you can never overdo it. Come on. I, I just don't want to irradiate the area. And I think the only thing left to do is to, well, hook this in like so. And I think that's it. So this does rely on the sun, which will constantly, constantly be able to run because it is daytime. And then this just needs to run. Um, and so I think we're just about ready to turn this reactor on and feed it the fizzle fuel. Uh, this is kind of scary. I'm always scared when I turn it on for the first time. I think I just need to check my notes a couple of times before we uh, click the on button. All right, I, I think we're ready. I think we're ready. I just need to place the quantum entangle porter in front of my reactor fuel port. And this is going to input, and then we just need to select the fizzle fuel, and we'll set that. And then to actually turn it on, well, we just need to go under the gases and hit auto eject. That should fill this, I think, with the fizzle fuel. Oh, wait, 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 no, no, no. That's because this port needs to be set to input. Yeah, it needs to be set to input. Okay, so that should work. I don't think I'll have to pipe to it. Fizzle fuel, side config, gases. Oh, that's because the back is set to an input. Okay, we need to set the back to an output. As soon as we do this, let's turn this off. As soon as we do this, it'll turn on. Oh, and there it goes. Okay, so just to check real quick, and I know it's very loud, the best thing to do is go reactor and to mute this. Um, but what we need to check is immediately is if the waste is filling up, which it's not. So that means waste is going here, being produced, and a little bit of plutonium is being produced here. And nothing is gonna go in here just yet because there is some sort of priority thing that this does, which is kind of interesting. So it will prioritize this first. Uh, the thing that I typically tend to do is once we have enough resources, I just turn off the machine, and then that will allow this other machine to run. So with that in mind, we can now start to tweak some things now that we see that we don't have waste or heat or anything. So this is where we start playing around with the burn rate and this is where it can get a little bit tricky. So my goal is to at least have a burn rate of 80. I feel like 80 is really, really good. 
Um, but it comes at a cost of our temperature down here, which we do need to keep in mind. Now, some optimal temperatures are keeping it around the 1000 to 1200 range. Anything above that is when it becomes very dangerous. Um, and unfortunately with a water cooled version of this, we can't get our rates any higher than a certain amount. So that's why I said 80 is pretty good. Let's go ahead and just do 35 right now. Um, now we'll notice at 35, our temperature goes up. Uh, we're now using 35 millibuckets a tick of our fizzle fuel. So that means we need at least 35 millibuckets a tick being generated. Um, and we're going to notice that right here, if we keep an eye on our fizzle fuel usage, we'll notice it's, it's honestly going up. It's still going up. So that means that at this burn rate, we're probably not losing out, even though there is a backlog that has built up inside of these machines, which is something we're going to have to keep in mind. Um, but yes, notice 250 millibuckets. I don't know if that's the exact rate that this is producing it at, but it is the same thing that I experienced in Volcano Block. Once you start producing a, so much of it, you start to run into that number. Now, I'm going to continue bumping this up. Now, at 35, that's still pretty good. We're going to notice that this is honestly producing polonium at a pretty decent rate. Um, we are going to need some power onto this, so let's get ourselves some uh, power. That's one thing I did not set up. Let's put some gates on here on these two machines um, because we're going to need the resource build up. We're also going to probably need to upgrade these machines, but we're already producing our first polonium pellet. Yeah, po polonium, not plutonium. You know what? I, um, I do that. I make that mistake all the time. Uh, but yes, this one's going to produce uh, the other pellet. So yes, this is pl plut oh, this is polonium. And then this one over here will produce plutonium. Um, but yes, this is going to constantly run. And this is the whole reason we're in a day dimension. So this is going to run very fast. Ah, so nice. All right. So let's experiment a little bit more. Let's go ahead and, and bump this up. Let's do, let's do 50. Is this going to start to cause problems? So we notice that the temperature went up even more. Okay, so we're still doing good, and it looks like we're still only use wanting, only using one of our tubes here to send steam out, so we haven't even used any of the others. Okay, let's continue. Let's see if we can go up even higher. Let's try 60. That's starting to get pretty dangerous with the water consumption rate, but we should be good on water consumption, and everything's seeming pretty good. We're getting up there in the temperature. Let's try 70. That's pushing it. It's pushing it definitely getting up there. We're still only seemingly using one of these ports. Maybe this was something that was fixed in the newer version where we weren't able to export out enough. All right. Now, when we start getting up to the 80s, things are getting a little bit tougher. Okay, we're at 80. Are we still using just one? Wow, we're still... Well, it looks like we're just using one. Okay, so we're at an 80 burn rate right now. That is insanely good. Um, and I think we could go even higher technically. So this is definitely filling up and is running. This is also running. Uh, this does need power, so we can get power on that because that will not start working unless we have power. So now at this burn rate, we're actually starting to send out more nuclear waste and stuff than I think these things are going to be processing at without some upgrades. Ah, perfect. So now we are starting to produce the plutonium and this is plutonium, not polonium. I love these achievements. These are so good. Uh, but yes, this should now be filling up. I'm not noticing any heat buildup. The only thing that I will notice, I think, is a potential of our fizzle fuel not being able to keep up. We'll find that out shortly. Um, thankfully, our machine should shut off. It does look like we're still producing enough hexafluoride to keep this filled up because it's still stuck at max. So we have not, from what I'm seeing, hit our limit yet. Um, so that is uh, that is a big, big plus here. 80 burn rate is, is honestly really, really nice, but we could probably go higher. We could go higher. Let's, uh, let's, I don't want to blow up my machine, but at 90, do we see any, any noticeable change at 90? Okay. Not even noticing a, a change. We're getting up there in the temperature, but we're still good. So 100, can we do a 120? I feel like they, this is where I'm getting nervous. Uh, maybe 120, 110. We're getting up there in the burn rate. So our temperature is almost at a thousand. We're not there yet. All right, let's do 120. Wow. So we are, we are almost at a thousand at this burn rate. We're not losing out on fizzle fuel just yet. And it seems like our fizzle fuel is still completely filled. 
That is amazing. And this is probably just rearing along, just producing as much as it possibly can. And we are really starting to produce a bunch of these pellets. And these pellets are gonna be incredibly important because that is how we're gonna produce the SPS, which is how we actually make antimatter. So just like I had mentioned before, it looks like everything is good here. We shouldn't end up with any explosions. This should be able to control this redstone that we have set on this machine under the activated. The status of it right now says it's powered, in which it is powered, so it's good to see that we're actually seeing the, the redstone signal. Everything should be good here, and if these flip, remember that will invert this signal with this inverter that we made over here, and we'll shut the reactor off. So that fail safe is a peace of mind and there's nothing better than having some peace of mind. Now, I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Hopefully you learned something new about the mechanism fission reactor as this thing can be kind of dangerous, but also very rewarding once you get production of antimatter started. Before you know it, we're gonna have a ton of antimatter laying around and with this setup, we should be able to do it with no problem. And well, guys, if you did enjoy, click that subscribe button and comment down below. What would you have done differently? Because that's how I learn from you guys. I, I learn from you guys so, so very much. So be sure to let me know down, like I said, in the comments below. And now it's time to thank the amazing supporter of today's episode. And that amazing thanks is going to go out to MVP. Thank you so much for your amazing support, by the way, over on the Discord and becoming a Discord premium member and supporting in one of the best ways possible. And that is through Discord discord.gg forward slash chosen architect and join the amazing crew today of over 30,000 members and growing for members joining just like you guys thank you so very much i'll see you in the next one and as always thanks for watching bye